let me introduce our presenter, Cindy Bergdorf. Um, she is a master gardener of San Francisco and San Mateo, and she has been a master gardener for 14 years. She's been gardening for over 66 years. She started with cherry tomatoes in her grandmother's garden. Um, she's on a one and a half acre property that has year round vegetable gardens, gardens devoted to bees and butterflies. She has six beehives, seven chickens, a worm bin and six compost bins. Her yard is a Monarch way station, also a certified butterfly garden and a certified wildlife habitat and a certified bee friendly garden. So with that, I turn it over to Cindy. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Bob. <clears throat> um, I don't know if um, oh, I'm stuck. I don't know if very many of you are familiar with Master Gardeners. Uh, we're a volunteer organization that's part of UC California, and uh, we are. Our um, objective is to bring scientific information to backyard gardeners. Uh, we have a helpline where you can um, send us questions. You can email questions to you. And our helplines are going to be open soon if you want to visit us in person. But um, we are happy to take questions about all kinds of gardening. With that, we'll talk about um, who do we want to attract? This um, presentation is about attracting bees, butterflies, and I'm going to throw hummingbirds in there too, uh, that we want to attract to our yard. How do we attract them? What are their life cycles and what are their habitat requirements? What I'm going to walk you through first is to understand habitat requirements and how that makes a difference. This is the same kind of process a master gardener would walk you through of in reverse if there was some wildlife that you didn't want in your garden, uh, maybe raccoons or skunks or gophers or squirrels. Uh, we would talk about the, their habitat and what you don't want to provide for them. Today we're going to talk about what we do want to provide so that we can attract uh, pollinators. Four basic wildlife needs food, water, cover, and space. And these are the four things that you would have to think about if you want to include or exclude wildlife from your backyard. So first of all, you need to understand a little bit about who we are trying to attract and how they live and what they need. Um, there are over 1,600 separate species of bees, native bees in California. Most of them are solitary nesters and are non-aggressive. Many do not even have the capability to sting. European bees are the only ones that live in large hives and defend them. Western or European honeybees uh, are worldwide. They're the most common honeybee in the world. There were no honeybees in the U.S. before Europeans arrived. You can see a picture of the, our standard little European honeybee. Uh, this is the same species worldwide. Their season is year-round, so you'll see bees all through the year, although uh, less predominantly when it's cold. Uh, they have three layers of pass, so a queen, worker, and drones. Their natural habitat is to nest in large cavities in the tree, in the ground, in buildings, or in hive boxes of commercial or uh, backyard beekeepers. They have a broad, um, they're a broad generalist and like a lot of different kinds of nectar and pollen plants. Uh, in terms of native bees, there are 4,000 species native to the U.S. and 1,600 native to California. 26 of those species are bumblebees. The rest are all solitary bees. And I'll explain what I mean by solitary bees. 
Uh, but I'm going to give you an example of three um, species of California native bees, digger bees, carpenter bees, and then bumblebees. A digger bee, there are 40 species in California. Their season, when you're going to see them out and about, is either March, June, which is the spring native flowering season, or May to October. Um, they gener generally have one or two generations per year, which is the female lays the eggs, the eggs develop and become an adult. Uh, that would be one generation. Sometimes there's two per year, particularly if there's a, a longer season, say May to October. They're solitary. That means they do not congregate in a hive with other bees. They may congregate near each other, but they're not part of a common unified group. They, uh, they nest in flat bare ground or on vertical banks, like in a, a creek side, it, where the dirt goes up side, they may burrow into those soft sides of the banks. You can see a, a picture here of a digger bee coming out of the ground. Our nesting habits of solitary bees can be very different. The one on the left is a carpenter bee. And they go into um, plants or other things that are, are round, um, stalks, things like that. Uh, they also will um, actually bore their way into fence, wooden posts, things like that. The middle picture is a picture of a digger bee coming out of the ground itself. And the far right, you can see there's several holes in the ground and there might be a cluster of solitary bees that have built nests in this bare ground area. Uh, they don't work with each other, they work independently. They may cluster in the same area. Brown nesters need clear or weedy dirt area to uh, lay their eggs. Carpenter bees, we have three species in California. They are year round, the peak when you'll see the most of them is from March to August. They also are solitary and long lived. They drill into soft or decaying wood or pithy stems of uh, plants. You can see the picture, it looks like he's got a, a jacket on. Oh, by the way, I we have uh, carpenter bees active in our backyard and they, they're right by the fence gate to my back, backyard. And um, the first ones that come out, because the, the, the female will lay eggs in a, in a, a tunnel that she creates in the wood, she lays an egg and then she covers it with um, bee bread, which is honey and pollen mixed together. And she'll back out a little bit, lay another one, repeat, back out a little further, repeat. And the first ones that um, pupate and come out of the hole will be the last ones laid. And they're all the males. And then the males will hang around that area waiting for the females to come out uh, to mate with them. So when we go in uh, about this time of year, or a little bit later, when we go through our gate, there'll be a whole bunch of, of uh, carpenter bees flying around there. Um, they don't have a stinger. Uh, the drones can't sting you if they wanted to, uh, but they try to kind of frighten you off by flying around your head. Uh, they won't hurt you. You just kind of brush them off or walk through them and they, and they um, fly away. <clears throat> okay, bumblebees. There were 26 species in California. They have annual colonies, which means that a colony begins, develops, has queen workers and drones, and then they all die off at the end of the season. They're present uh, most of the 
flowering season. Um, I have uh, several California buckeye trees in my yard. And they love, love, love the flowers on, on there. And right now the tree is just covered with red flowers and lots of uh, bumblebees flying all around. Uh, they nest underground in abandoned rodent burrows um, or abandoned bird nests in cavities. Um, this is how it works. A, um, a queen, a, a female, fertilized fem female, will hibernate somewhere, usually under leaves and debris, things like that in your yard. Uh, when it starts to get warm, she wakes up, she uh, goes out and starts gathering nectar and pollen for herself uh, to gather up her strength. And she looks for a place uh, for a nest, uh, an underground uh, rodent hole or something like that. Um, then she'll make a number of trips because she is will be a worker for a while, gathering honey and pollen. She uh, puts into a little cup. It's like a honey cup. And then once it gets full, she'll stay in this burrow and she'll lay a bunch of eggs. She'll cover them with pollen and then she'll sit on it just like as if she were a chicken or a duck with a bunch of eggs. And she'll stay there until they pupate. Then those bees become the workers and the drones. They then will now go out and collect uh, food for her as she continues to lay eggs and develop more bumblebees. And this will go on all summer until you get to the fall. And then um, all of the drones will die off. The females will go and, and separate and uh, there will be nothing left in the burrow by the time winter comes. So they, they, they kind of have a, um, um, a hive, except they don't collect honey in the hive like honeybees do. Uh, like European honeybees do, they just collect enough to sustain themselves, the workers and the queen and the new babies that are that are being um, laid and developed. <clears throat> and this is what a bumblebee looks like. They're furrier looking um, and um, have long wings. All right, let's talk a little bit about butterflies. Here are some pictures of some butterflies that you may be familiar with. Monarchs, swallowtails, cabbage whites. Uh, these are all uh, butterflies that are native to the Bay Area. Here are some more uh, butterflies that are native to the Bay Area. And I'm sure you've seen uh, some of these before as well. Uh, Butterflies have a very different life cycle and structure than bees do. Um, there's um, about 20,000 species of butterflies worldwide. Just under 600 species are in the U.S. About a quarter of those are native to the Bay Area alone. Many of them are year-round uh, butterflies that you see. Um, the Bay Area, however, has the highest density of endangered species in the U.S., and that's mainly because of lack of habitat. Um, obviously, lots of building and um, people and pesticides. Uh, there is one person who can make a difference, and that's you. And I'll tell you a little later about a special Bay Area person who did just that. Okay. There's a very specific key to attracting butterflies. First of all, each species, each butterfly has a preferred host plant. They lay their eggs on this host plant. This is the only food for that particular caterpillar or butterfly. The adults, after they're actually butterflies, are less picky. Almost any nectar plant 
will feed them. They, there are some types that they like better because of landing and uh, ability to get at it with their long tongue. And I'll talk about some of those later. If you really want butterflies in your yard, you must include post plant. So let's talk about uh, monarch butterflies, which are uh, one of the best known. Uh, this is Greek. Their Latin name is Greek for sleeping transformation. Uh, this is the life cycle of a monarch butterfly. They, the, the monarch female will lay an egg. It takes three to five days for it to hatch. The larvae then take nine to 14 days to uh, develop. Uh, and the chrysalis will take, and then the, the butterfly will be in a chrysalis for eight, 13 days. The, the range of days depends largely on the weather. The warmer it is, the faster they mature. Uh, the cooler it is, rainy or whatever, the slower they mature. The adults themselves live two to six weeks. Monarch butterflies uh, travel during that time. They migrate, and I'll talk a little bit about Western migration. Uh, here's a picture of a couple of monarch butterfly eggs. And you can see relative to pencils, how pencil lead, how small they are. And they're, they're laid singly, one at a time, underneath the milkweed leaves. So this is the underside of a milkweed leaf with two, um, two eggs on it. This is what a monarch egg looks like under a microscope. Uh, I think they're really pretty unusual, but that be interesting. Uh, it's a tough life for uh, monarchs. Uh, the eggs are only laid on milkweed. So the less milkweed we have in the area, the less eggs that are laid. After that, only three to 5% of the eggs laid actually survive to adulthood. Uh, this is due to predators, weather, disease and parasites, lack of milkweed and pesticides. Uh, their habitat is largely disappearing in California. We're supposed to have been declared endangered in 2019 uh, but the federal agency that's working on that is still working on that. Uh, here's a picture that shows uh, the monarch caterpillars going through their five instar stages. What will happen is that once the larvae is, is, um, comes out of the egg, see number one down at the bottom, um, they're very small, but they're very, very hungry. And they'll start eating uh, away at the milkweed leaves. Um, after a few days, uh, they will grow big, like number two, and they'll um, actually shed their skin so they have more room to grow. And they'll do that three more times as they go from two to three to four, to fifth in stars. And you can see how big they grow in just two weeks or less. <clears throat> One of the reasons I wanted to do this preliminary to talking about um, butterflies is I wanted people to recognize when they have butterfly caterpillars in their garden and that you don't get upset and try to kill them because they're really quite beautiful. Uh, this is a monarch. Uh, this was a um, single pictures taken of a, of a monarch caterpillar going into chrysalis. First, they put a little bit of silk onto a stem or a branch to fasten themselves, and they turn into a J shape. And then the chrysalis material begins from their head to the, their bottom end. Uh, this whole process from left to right takes about two minutes achieve. And it's a it's a green uh, spherical uh, shape, it has kind of gold tones, sometimes little gold dots on it. 
uh, and they're very beautiful. You'll find them sometimes away from your milkweed plant. It's like they walk away from the milkweed plant and create their chrysalis someplace else, uh, maybe to protect themselves. The host plant for monarchs is milkweed, milkweed, or milkweed. Um, there's, if there's no milkweed, there's no monarchs. Uh, fortunately, there are over 100 varieties that are native to the U.S. There are 60 varieties that are native to California. And there, are very, there are many environmental and climate choices. Uh, later on, I'll talk about some of the different kinds of milkweed uh, that you can choose. Let's talk about tiger swallowtails. Uh, they're a familiar um, fly to our backyards. This is what the caterpillar of a Western tiger swallowtail looks like. Their whole uh, development process is approximately the same as a monarch. Uh, the only difference is they may be in chrysalis much longer. Uh, but this is their um, this is what their caterpillar looks like. This is what their chrysalis looks like. If you notice. Um, they have, a, it looks like a piece of wire or uh, thread uh, wrapped around that and wrapped around the tree. That's called a girdle. And it attaches, helps to attach the chrysalis to whatever it is, um, wherever they're going to, uh, um, I want to say overwinter, they often overwinter, but whatever they're going to stay in the chrysalis. Swallowtails, depending upon how late in the season, if it's still early in the season, then they'll be in the chrysalis for a couple of weeks and then turn into a butterfly. If it's late, if it's the fall, if it's September, October, and it's starting to get cold, they'll go into chrysalis and stay in chrysalis the entire winter and won't come out, won't emerge until the following spring when it warms up again. So you want to be careful when you're cleaning up your garden. You may want to leave some of those leaves and litter until the springtime because you may actually have chrysalis in there as well. Or you've got to carefully look before you cut branches um, in the fall and winter. Host plants for Western tiger swallowtails are primarily large trees, sycamore, ash, willows, lilac, cherry, privet, cottonwoods, aspen. Um, most of these are not plants that people typically plant in their backyard unless they have a piece of property. Um, however, I would encourage you to encourage your local city parks and recreation department to plant them in your parks. Beautiful trees, they would do nicely in parks because there's more room. Um, they also host tiger swallowtails. This is an anise swallowtail. It looks very similar. You notice it has more blue on it. And this is what the caterpillar of an anise swallowtail looks like. Um, red and black and white. Kind of, supposed to look kind of scary. Uh, this is what their um, chrysalis looks like. Again, you can see the girdle uh, attaching to a branch and that holds the chrysalis in place. Not surprisingly, the host plants for anise swallowtails is anise, which is fennel, and also other plants of that same family, the fennel anise family, like dill, parsley, carrots, celery, parsnips, and surprisingly, citrus trees like lemons and oranges. So you should, should for this reason, you should be very careful about spraying um, these vegetable plants and also lemon and orange trees because they are host plants for swallowtails. <clears throat> Luckily, anise in our area grows very well in unused spaces. So if you see, you'll see them along the sides of roads, even the freeway. A lot of anise plants growing, and those are all good host plants for swallowtails. 
This is a special story about California pipevine swallowtails. They're blue, they're really a beautiful butterfly. This is the underside of their wings. When they have them closed, you can see the underside, also very pretty. Uh, in some places in California, namely uh, the peninsula in San Francisco, there used to be, there used to be a lot of them. Um, but they've almost become extinct here. They're much more, much easier to find up in areas in Northern California where um, pipevine grows. But I'd like you to meet Tim Wong. Tim is an aquatic biologist with the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. He remembers, um, he remembers vine swallowtails when he was a young person on the peninsula. He lived both in San Francisco and in Hillsborough. And then as he got older and was a scientist, uh, he, was, he lamented the fact that he didn't see them anymore. He did see them in the botanical gardens in San Francisco where they had some pipevine growing. So Tim built a butterfly structure in his backyard in San Francisco, where he grew a lot of pipevine. He then was able to collect some pipevine caterpillars, put them in, the yacht, in this enclosure, along with um, uh, nectar plants for the adults. You can see lots of different nectar plants there. And he started raising pipevine um, swallowtails in his backyard until he got quite accumulation. And then he began letting them go in the botanical gardens and encouraging people to grow California pipe vine so that that would encourage the, um, uh, the return of the pipe vine swallowtails to the Bay Area. Pipe vine um, swallowtails lay only on California pipe vine, and um, they lay them in clusters. Most butterflies lay eggs singly, but um, for whatever reason, pipe vine swallowtails lay them in clusters like this, as you can see. Uh, they also tend to, this is what the caterpillar looks like, and kind of a scary dude. Um, and then you can see they also like to huddle together uh, when they're older. Here's a whole bunch of caterpillars on the pipe vine. You can see it's coming out of the ground and climbing all over the leaves and eating, and they all uh, stick close together. Uh, here are a number of pipe vine chrysalis. Again, you can see the girdles holding them to the, to the um, pipe vine, um, and they'll change different colors as they darken, as they get a little older and uh, more mature. This is what a California pipe vine flower looks like. It looks like an old fashioned Dutch pipe. It's also called Dutch pipe vine, uh, but this is the California native variety and um, grows um, mainly on fences and trees and bushes and things like that. We can grow it here in the Bay Area, uh, and I've purchased pipe vine at the Botanical Gardens in San Francisco when they have their annual sales. Um, other um, butterflies that we have a lot of here in the Bay Area is the West Coast Lady. Uh, this is her uh, caterpillar. Uh, caterpillars that tend to be um, fluffy like this or, or sometimes have very painful spikes in there. So I'd be very careful about touching one. Um, but this is what her caterpillar looks like. And the host plants for the West Coast Lady are hollyhocks and members of the mallow family. Cabbage whites, if you've ever grown cabbage, you know what cabbage white ca caterpillars look like. Uh, they'll either look like this, yellow and black, or they'll look like this, green. And they'll look like loopers. They'll 
scrunch themselves up, the back end will come up to the front end as they walk, and then the front end will stretch out, and then they'll scrunch up the back end to catch up again. Uh, the host plants for cabbage whites are Bialmi, which is spider flower, um, also members of the mustard family, cabbage, broccoli, kale, cauliflower, etc., are all host plants for cabbage whites. So if something is not eating your plants, your garden is not part of the ecosystem. Um, but you need to be aware of what um, these caterpillars look like so that you won't inadvertently destroy them in your yard. I'll talk just a little bit about hummingbirds. Uh, they also are uh, very native here and attractive to yards. Many of the plants that they like are also uh, common to bees and butterflies. Okay, Allen butterflies are common only in California. Uh, they're especially concentrated in the, in the Bay Area. They have a green back and they're somewhat year round here. The black chin hummingbird is the most common hummer in the Western US and it's found throughout California. It also, it migrates great distances. Um, it can migrate all the way to Alaska uh, from California. And as hummingbirds uh, is the greatest consumer of insects of all the hummingbirds. They're common in, in all over California, especially in Southern California. And they sing more than any other hummer. You'll hear them making uh, a lot of noise as they go along. <coughs> They're um, uh, very good to have in the yard. You don't need pesticides if you've got hummingbirds because they will eat insects of all types. Uh, hummingbirds are very unique in a lot of ways. Proportionally for their size, they have the largest heart, they have the largest pectoral muscles, that's their flying muscles. Um, they cannot walk, you may see them standing on uh, a branch or something. They actually can't walk, they're so top heavy. Um, they, uh, 65 to 70% of what they consume protein. Even though people put out hummingbird feeders, and they love the nectar, they love the sugar water, 65% of what they eat is insects. Uh, typically spiders, um, mosquitoes, eat bugs right out of the air as they're flying. Um, the other things that are unique about hummingbirds is that they're the only ones that can sustain and for a sustained period of time, fly backward, upside down. Um, they're quite the acrobats. Some of the favorites of a hummingbird are plants that have deep throats, like the trumpet vine, because hummingbirds have a very long tongue they can reach in there with. So things like fuchsias and lantanas, all of these are favorites. I'll point out some others as well. These are some favorites of hummingbirds. Um, columbines, delphiniums, hollyhocks, salvias, and California fuchsias, that's a native plant, are all um, attract a lot of hummingbirds. <clears throat> One of their multi-purpose favorites are actually spiders. Uh, they eat insects, as I said, for the protein. They can catch insects in mid-flight, see them flying around my yard a lot, at, like the late afternoon, and they're catching insects right out of the air. Um, they'll eat insects right out of a spider web, including the spider. Uh, it's very, spiders are very important, obviously then, hummingbirds. And they use the web for building their nest, attaching it to the trees. It also allows their nest to be very flexible, have a very, very, very small nest, with little tiny eggs, they lay two eggs at a time. And the nest will actually expand as the baby hummingbirds get bigger. So it's very important that you not kill spiders and um, caterpillars and things like that that are in your yard. They're very necessary 
for not only hummingbirds, but also for all of the bees, um, native bees and, and bees, birds, native birds in our area. <clears throat> Um, feeding nectar to hummingbirds is easy. There's all kinds of commercial bird feeders that you can find on the market. Everything from tiny to huge to decorative. Um, it's easy to attract them. They love flowers as well and that will attract them without single feeder. No cleaning required, no feed, filling, etc. Okay, so now that we've gone through kind of what are the needs, what, what, how do these, these things that we want in our yard live, I'm going to talk about some of the most important things you can do to bring more of them into your butterfly, hummingbird, bee habitat. And the number one is no pesticides. Pesticides kill very well. Not only kill spiders and ants, kill bees, butterflies, caterpillars, and other beneficial insects that come to your yard. This includes so-called safe or organic pesticides. They're only safe for humans. They're not safe for bees, butterflies, or hummingbirds. And that includes BT, insecticidal soap, dormant oil, oil spray, Spinsad and pyrethrine. Uh, also, be sure not to use any neonicotinoids. Uh, th these are the most widely used insecticides in the world. They've now been banned in the European Union. No part of the plant is safe for pollinators after they've been sprayed neonicotinoids. And that's because the plant will um, absorb the poison through not only leaves, roots, flowers, everything. So no part of it is going to be safe for pollinators. Um, it's a very long-lived insecticide. Actually, ab about a dozen different kinds that fall in this category. And they can persist in the environment for months or years. They're water-soluble. So they can actually be taken up by nearby plants. They can um, contaminate the watershed. And they can poison ground-dwelling bees. Uh, this is a label uh, from a plant that I purchased at Home Depot. Uh, you can see it's on the one on the left. It says, this plant is protected from problematic aphids, white flies, beetles, and mealybugs, and other unwanted pests and neonectoids. This plant has been sprayed with neonectoids. It's going to be, and on the back it says it's treated with neonectoids. It does say that these have been approved by the EPA, which is really a shame because they should never have approved them, but, um, but they have. Uh, so if you see plants have this in a, and they stick it in the pot, do not purchase them because they are not good for your garden, or for your pollinators. Bugs know how to find bad bugs. Uh, when plants are being attacked by mealybugs or aphids or whatever, plants themselves will send out a distress signal when they're attacked. That is going to attract good bugs like ladybugs and others will prey on the bad bugs. Even the poop of the bad bugs is a lure to the good bugs. So allow nature to claim your garden, use uh, a water spray out of your hose, uh, other ways to get rid of bugs besides spraying them. Number two, ditch your lawn. Lawns use huge amounts of water. If you don't compost those lawn clippings, you're adding to the landfill. If you don't have a lawn, you get to sleep in on the weekends. No mowing is needed. Unless you have lots and lots and lots of dandelions, your pollinators are not interested. This is not a pollinator friendly yard. Uh, there's nothing here that's going to interest bees or butterflies or hummingbirds. This is a pollinator friendly yard. This is a pollinator friendly yard. 
this is a very small yard. There, there, I can see here, I think there are five. Oops. Sorry. There are five different um, plant, actually five different kinds of plants in this yard. Um, that's all it really takes. So it's a small yard, only has five different kinds of plants. This would be a great pollinator yard. Your pollen, your garden can be pollen containers and you can attract pollinators. You can have one container and you can attract pollinators uh, to your yard. Uh, number three, plant for all seasons. Um, pollen and nectar are needed from early spring to late fall. Uh, and I told you about the lifespan of bees and butterflies. So they're gonna be around for a while. So you need to, to provide for them during that period. Uh, generally speaking, um, I would plant, uh, if, if I had to divide it up, I, I would say 10% of my garden had to be spring blooming, 40% summer blooming, 50% fall blooming, because that's when the bees and butterflies are trying to bulk up before winter. Uh, here are three native spring flowers. Theonothus, ribes, and hellebore are very popular in this area. Theonothus, there's literally dozens of varieties. They grow everywhere from a ground cover up to 30 foot tall trees and, and shrubs. Uh, they come in white, uh, pink, lavender, and blue. Uh, so there's lots of options. They grow very well and they're very um, uh, um, drought tolerant. It's a good plant for our area. <clears throat> Ribes is a very beautiful plant. Uh, it has these lovely flowers. It generally comes in white and pink, um, some kinds kind of a red. Uh, they like an area that has not so much sunlight, maybe morning sun, afternoon shade. A hellebore is about the same, morning sun, afternoon shade. So the, here are some options. Um, Ceanothus can grow in any, um, they'll grow in the shade, they'll grow in the heavy sun, not so particular. Some more natives that are good choices are valerian, um, snapdragons, which believe it or not are actually natives, and also cosmos. These are all good choices. These three all grow well in the sun and are all very easy to grow. Um, some other plants that are easy to grow in our natives are yarrow. Uh, yarrow comes in yellow, white, pink, lavender, red, kind of a mustard color, kind of a brick color, come in lots of different colors. Uh, they're particularly liked by bees and um, butterflies. They have a flat top, which butterflies like. It's a nice landing spot. They like something like that, that stable that they can sit on. Uh, Monarda, uh, the, the uh, uh, <clears throat> local name is bee balm, so you can tell that something that bees like, and obviously lavender, uh, the bees like lavender. Some other native choices are Echinacea, Asters, and Maynite Salvias. Uh, these are all good choices. They're all drought tolerant. They all grow in Good sun. Uh, some more plants, uh, cat mint. Uh, I love cat mint in my yard. The bees just love, love, love it. Um, cats don't really, it's not like um, something that'll attract cat, cats, even though they call it cat mint. Uh, Titonia is a butterfly favorite. They love this plant. It comes in yellow and orange. Uh, sticky monkey flower is also a favorite, also of hummingbirds. It comes in um, white, yellow, pink, I think, uh, red, lots of different colors, and um, 
and the leaves on them are actually very sticky. Uh, so that's why they call it. And the little faces look like little monkeys. Another um, favorite <clears throat> of our pollinators are salvias and sages of all kinds. Uh, these four, these are four of the ones I have in my garden. Russian sage comes in blue, a hot lip salvia, uh, they're red and white. Uh, Chiapas sage is kind of a dark pink. Jerusalem sage is a yellow. Uh, three more that I have in my garden, pineapple sage. This is a wonderful plant. Hummingbirds love this plant. It, it tends to um, bloom for the end of the summer and end of the fall. Hummingbirds are all over it. And if you crush the leaves and smell them, they smell just like pineapple. Hummingbird sage, obviously a favorite of hummingbirds. This is a plant that grows well under uh, oak trees and requires little or no um, uh, watering in the summertime. You can grow it under trees and it'll be just fine with no summer water at all. Um, velvet sage is um, stands up really nicely, keeps its shape well. <coughs> okay, so salvias. Oops, sorry, wrong direction. Okay, number four, you want to get the attention of our pollinators. Bees like purple, blue, violet, yellow, and white. Hummingbirds prefer red. They also like yellow, orange, pink, and purple. Butterflies prefer white, pink, purple, red, and yellow. Part of getting their attention is planting in groups of three to five plants at a time. So you have a big not plant here and a plant there singly. You want big groups, broad swaths of color, lure in bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds. This is a good garden for pollinators. You can notice that you can pick out the distinct plots of each of the different kinds of plants in this yard. Uh, that's important to attracting <clears throat> flies that are flittering around. Okay, here's one that most people don't know about. That's to skip hybridized plants. These are plants that have double flowers. They're frilly, uh, they're pretty, uh, but they're useless for bees and butterflies. They have extra petals instead of anthers. Anthers are the pollen producers, so they don't produce pollen, and they don't produce nectar for the most part. Very little nectar or pollen in a hybridized plant. It's not what they were um, developed for. These are plants that have been bred to look pretty, not to be good for your pollinators. I'll give you an example. Here's an old-fashioned cosmos. Number one, you can see it's got it's got a bullseye. This is the landing pattern. This is what attracts the bee or the butterfly to the center of the plant where the nectar and the pollen is. Okay, that's the old fashioned cosmos. You can buy seeds for them anywhere. Here's a hybridized cosmos. You can see that you can barely see the center and, what, and you can't see the landing circle at all. And what there is there won't have near, won't have any nectar at all in it for, <clears throat> for the bees or the butterflies. Here is a perfect zinnia. Again, notice that it has a target. And, it, and then it has the anthers, which have the pollen on them. And then in the very center is nectar. So it really, really is a target for a bee or a butterfly. Here's one that's partially hybridized. You can see it has all the double flowers. The center is much smaller. The target is gone. Here they're gone completely. You can't even see the center of the plant. There is no anthers there. And <clears throat> these plants will typically, obviously, be sterile because they can't be pollinated. Another way to attract herbs, uh, um, butterflies and 
bees to your garden is herbs. You'll notice that there are bees on every single one of these pictures. And there's a reason for that. They're very, very popular with bees. So things like rosemary, oregano, um, um, oh, borage, thyme, parsley. <clears throat> Let me tell you a little, uh, uh, borage brings up a good um, thing here. Um, plants produce nectar at a different rate. Some produce them very, very quickly. For example, borage, which is loved, 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 loved by bees, replaces its nectar inside of its flower in two minutes. So you know why the bees are always all over them all the time. By the time the bee takes the nectar, flies back to the hive, and comes back again, ah, there'll be more nectar there. <laughs> so that's a wonderful plant for a bee garden if you want one. <clears throat> and they'll attract them all the time. Other plants take longer, sometimes two days, to replace their nectar. And keep in mind, some plants don't have nectar at all because they're not pollinated by, by bees and butterflies and hummingbirds, things that are looking for nectar. Uh, for example, corn and grapes are wind pollinated. They don't, they don't attract bees or butterflies at all. Other plants are pollinated by water or um, can be pollinated by bats at night. It can be um, uh, hoverflies, um, skinks, which are like lizards. All, all plants have evolved to be pollinated in certain ways. What you're looking for in your garden is plants that have nectar pollen so that they can produce more and attract bees and butterflies. Um, most of the big plant companies like Annie's and uh, Bonnie's and others on their website, they'll have a list of bee plants. Um, California UC Davis um, has a list of bee attracting plants. <clears throat> These are going to be plants that have lots of nectar replace their nectar very quickly. All right, you're gonna have to plant host plants if you want butterflies. I told you about milkweed being a good choice for nectar in addition to being a good host plant. 16 varieties, here's one, butterfly weed. Um, here's a native uh, also, a narrow leaf, or Mexican world um, milkweed. Showy milkweed, swamp milkweed. Now, just because his name says it's a swamp milkweed, you do not have to have a swamp to grow it. It will grow just fine in an ordinary backyard. Purple milkweed, tropical milkweed. Now, tropical milkweed, there's a lot of controversy about whether or not you should have it because it does carry, or it could carry, um, a disease for butterflies, particularly monarchs. Um, all milkweed has the capacity to do that. Most milkweed dies down in the winter. And the leaves disappear. Whatever is on those leaves dies. And when the new leaves come up in the springtime. They're clean and don't have anything on them. Tropical milkweed does not die down in the winter. So the simple solution is you cut them down to a couple inches off the ground. And they'll come back in the spring just fine and they'll be clean, not have any disease on them. Okay, number eight. Remember back to what creates habitat. In addition to food, we need a water source. These in particular need a lot of water. They need it for cooling evaporation inside of the hive. You need it for recrystallizing the honey. You ever had honey in a jar that crystallizes? Well, you, you can recrystallize it with a little bit of water. That's what the bees do. They need it for digestion and they need it to feed their babies. Uh, butterflies need water and minerals, uh, particularly for males, salts in the soil. 
Um, water in both cases should be very shallow. shallow. Puddles are preferred. Small sand or small rocks are best. And if you really want to attract them, you can add a layer of horse manure or cow manure on top and they'll be just delighted. Hummingbirds don't need a water source for drinking. They get plenty from the nectar that they drink. However, they love, love, love a mister or a fountain spray. They fly through it and they just love misters. <clears throat> Any bird baths that you use should be, should be shallow and or filled with rocks so that they won't uh, slip and fall. Even birds, even for birds. Uh, here's an example of a um, water for um, bees and butterflies. You can see it's been filled with marbles, so they can land on that. They don't drown in the water. Here's one with a little bit larger rocks. Oh, I got all kinds of things today. Um, here is a used water from a pet water. Uh, you can see the bees obviously love it. Very shallow, they can get down to the water, but they're not gonna drown. Uh, here's an example of one that is good for both bees and butterflies. Butterflies like to sit on the warm rocks. It helps to warm them up. And um, they like, they can get their long tongue down between the rocks for the water. Um, bees like the sand better, but this would be a very good, um, water for both bees and butterflies. And this is from butterflylady.com. This is from her backyard. Um, they're looking for a place in the sun for basking, so flat rocks um, are something that butterflies lot like. And as I said, they like, they like puddles. Uh, if you've ever been on a farm, you'll notice that all around the watering tank, the trough, it usually leaks or the, the animals get water out of it, drip it on the ground. The ground is all mucky. Butterflies love that. It has everything they need in it. <clears throat> it has the minerals, it has the water, it's shallow, it's good for them. <clears throat> Here's another example of a, another way to grow with small rock. And I'd like to have somebody make this one for me because this is my very favorite. Um, it can be, so you can see, obviously be very artistic for your yard and be a watering source for bees and butterflies. I want to give you an example, a couple examples of what you can do for your yard. Um, this is my oldest daughter's front yard um, in Redwood City when she moved in. She had a whole front yard full of junipers probably were 30 years old. This is what it was like after we took out the junipers and added a lot of nectar plants and trees and flowers um, to attract bees and butterflies to her yard. Um, this is my middle daughter. She has had a whole front yard full of Bermuda grass. Again, not very appealing to any kind of bees or butterflies. This is what it looked like soon after we planted it. There's salvias, um, there's lamb's ears, and there's stink, uh, sticky monkey plants. And <clears throat> um, so that you can see how much it changed the yard. And here's the sticky monkeys in bloom in the springtime. You can see it um, quite transformed their, her yard. And she has lots and lots and lots of bees and butterflies, hummingbirds, uh, visiting every day. I'd like to thank uh, San Mateo County Libraries uh, for inviting the Master Gardeners here today. I'd be happy to take your questions. I'm also going to provide Paula with a, um, probably a PDF file of this presentation and some handouts with a lot of helpful um, websites and links I've accumulated over the years. And I'll be sending those to you, and then she'll be sending them uh, to the people who've participated today. So thank you very much for having me, Paula. Great. Thank you. That was wonderful.
And there are some questions. So um, the first one is my milkweed plants often have many yellow aphids on them. Is this a deterrent to monarchs? I rarely, I rarely see monarchs. Uh, no, it isn't, but no, aphids are ucky. So the thing <laughs> to do, um, you can um, use water, a spray of water on them, which is probably not a good idea anymore since we're in a drought. So what I would suggest is you put on some, some plastic gloves, uh, latex gloves, and go out and just run your hand down the on the stem and on the leaves and just crush them as you go. Uh, and that will kill them. Aphids can be green, black, brown, yellow. They come in all different colors. So if you see little things on them, and then if you see little things that are brown, but look kind of empty, those are dead aphids that have been eaten by probably a wasp or um, a um, ladybug. <clears throat> Okay. Is ne neem oil safe for pollinators? Are there pollinators that will grow near or under cypress trees? Okay, first let's handle neem. Neem is not neem. good for pollinators. However, neem oil is usually used on fruit trees before they flower. So usually, um, usually it will not affect these are butterflies. However, the reason you put neem on your on your apple tree, for example, is to keep from getting the moth that that uh, as a worm gets into your apples. So you can see that no, it isn't good for pollinators. <coughs> now under cypress, hmm, I don't know. I'd have uh, you'd have to look for some plants that are nectar plants that grow in the shade. So like ribes and hellebores and things like that would probably grow under a, a cypress plant. I'd, I'd look on, on uh, li lists of nectar plants um, and actually some milkweeds will grow under cypress, will grow in the shade. So I'd look for plants that can grow in the shade that would be also on a list of nectar plants and um, pollinator plants. And how about succulents? Are they good for pollinating purposes? Oh yes, um, hummingbirds particularly love a lot of succulents. Their, their flowers come out and they're kind of tubular, which um, hummingbirds love. So yes, they're, they're a great option. And then what is the best way to clean the water sources for bees and butterflies um, to prevent algae growth? The best thing is probably to keep it out of the sun as much as possible. You may have to dump it all out and, and clean it out with a, a hose, you know, once a week or so. I, because it's shallow, you're not going to attract mosquitoes. So if you keep it really shallow, and in some of those pictures, are just rocks and sand, the, it isn't deep at all, so it's not going to grow algae. Um, is there anything that will grow in sandy soil? Yes, there are. Um, again, I would look on lists of plants for butterflies and pollinators. Um, I don't live on the coast. There are some master gardeners that do, and I would suggest contacting our master gardener office, talk to some of our master gardeners from the coast, and they would know what would uh, grow well. A, a good example though would be succulents. Um, several of them have great succulent gardens and they do attract pollinators. Um, here's a ladybug question. Is it a good idea to purchase ladybugs in a store and let them loose in the garden? Uh, if you have aphids, it it's, would be a good idea. Uh, they they tend to be very voracious, so they're going to eat up those aphids really quickly. If there aren't a lot of other aphids around, they're going to go look for some. So um, maybe is my answer. <laughs> um, next, ants. What is your recommendation for controlling ants? UC says to use borax solution for controlling 
carpenter ants, especially for citrus trees? Um, I would go with anything that you see uh, recommends. In fact, that would be exactly where I would go to look uh, for any um, things you're trying to get rid of, uh, pests that you're trying to get rid of would be to go. This will be a link on the things I, I send to you as suggestions. Um, is the UC IPM, uh, which is the Integrated Pest Management System. And there you can look up solutions for hundreds of pests. Right. This one's a little bit longer question. I try to control, control the amount of cabbage white in my garden. During spring and summer, late summer, I see many cabbage white and they become a pest in my garden. So I've been squishing them whenever I see them and try to put Rime on. The hardest is when I have to save my cabbage, kale, wood spring, organic, insecticidal soap. Um, a lot of other gardeners green have been eating up by the cabbage white as well. Is there a necessity to control them to pre prevent from loss of cabbage kale production if they are good beneficial insect? I, I, I think that the thing that you're using, uh, Rime, which for people who may not be familiar, Rime <laughs> is, is a um, trade name for floating row covers. Uh, it's a very, very thin material and it floats because um, it's very lightweight. You can put over your plants and then um, use um, rocks or something to, to get it down to the ground so that butterflies can't get under it. Um, that, that, is, that keeps it off of your plants and then they're not going to lay eggs on your um, kale or broccoli or cabbage, whatever, and they'll go someplace else and lay their uh, eggs. So that, that, it, that would be my number one recommendation, but you're gonna need to keep it on there and you're gonna need to keep it tightly covered, keep them out. Right. Um, next question is I've had two hummingbird nests in my yard. I think babies are now gone. At what point can I remove the nest? Example, prune the tree. Okay, um, hummingbirds can lay up to two sets of nests a year. So it's probably a little early. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't prune just yet because they may come back and lay the more eggs in those same nests again. Um, I, I'll, also, I can say, hooray, good for you. You obviously have a habitat that your hummingbirds love and you've got all of the right things, everything it takes to um, get hummingbirds into your garden. So good for you. Typically, it, they'll either have one or two nests a year. Again, because it's early, uh, I'd wait maybe at least midsummer before I prune, maybe wait until the fall uh, because they're not going to be laying eggs in the fall. So that would be the best time to prune. <clears throat> right. Well, I don't see any more questions. Oh, here another one came in. There is shout outs though to the Master Gardeners and how wonderful the program is. Thank you. Um, uh, crows have eaten hummingbird eggs in my shrubs. What to do? Uh, that, that is a difficult one because crows will eat eggs of almost any kind of bird. Um, so, I mean, the best thing to do is to try to keep the crows out of your yard if you can. And, but, but again, that's difficult too. Although they, I, I have had success with, um, I bought this from a, from a birding store in San Carlos. It looks like a stuffed crow. It's actually a, a foam bird. that's covered in dyed chicken feathers. And you put it out on your nighttime, you put it out in your yard somewhere and in the open space where they can see it and you lay it down. It looks to the, to the crows like it's a dead crow. And they will come and they'll actually have a funeral 
They'll all be around it. They'll make it be noise. They're trying to get the crow to get up and then they fly away. And then they um, are afraid of being in that yard because they don't know what killed that crow. So that, that scares them away. And I, um, I generally do it once or twice a year in my yard. They forget and come back. Uh, then I put it out again and they discover it in the morning and don't know where it came from and they somebody killed a crow. So that would be my, other than if you could somehow cover or partially cover the shrub that um, hummingbirds have their nests in so that they can get in and out without being attacked by the crows. My best guess, I don't know. <laughs> Right. Um, Luba says, wonderful pres pre presentation and relevant information. Thank you for providing the PDF. I couldn't write fast enough. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, well, I try to cover a lot of material, so I do talk fast. <laughs> <laughs> um, as, if there's no more questions, um, I guess we can say thank you. And there is a... Um, very, very short survey that we ask um, to let us know how we're doing and give us feedback. Juan put that into the chat, rate this event. So if you could um, fill that out, that'd be great. And uh, I don't see any more questions. So unless you have anything more to add, Cindy? Nope, uh, that's all I have for today. <clears throat> Great. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for coming and hope to see you again in another um, one of our Master Gardener presentations, hopefully, which will be in June.